24. Last week a funeral, this week a wedding. So this is a fun, this is a fun chapter, very, uh, very interesting. Let's, let's pray. Father, we ask you to bless our time in your word. And as we look at this uh, really great story of this anonymous servant going to find a bride for Isaac, Lord, what a great picture it is of how the Holy Spirit goes and gets a bride for, for the son at the command of the Father. So, so wonderful, wonderful typology here, Lord. I pray that it would minister to our hearts as, as well as just your, your providence and how you orchestrate details in, in our lives. So we pray once again that our study would be meaningful to us and, Lord, it would uh, uh, be used by you to bring change and transformation that we might be more like Jesus Christ for having worshipped and having studied your word together this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's interesting, it's the longest chapter in Genesis, 67 verses. I got six points. We'll, we'll, we're going to get done at least by 2 o'clock. So I just wanted to tell you that right, out the, right at the beginning. In contrast, uh, uh, the opening account of Genesis is uh, 31 verses. <laughs> so... 31 verses on the creation of the universe. A bride for Isaac, 67. <laughs> Very kind of interesting. Obviously, this is important. Uh, and I think because, as I prayed, the typology is, uh, is incredible. Again, going back to Abraham, who is like the father who takes his son Isaac up to Mount Moriah, the actual place where Jesus was, uh, was crucified. You have the father giving the son. You have the son willing to sacrifice his life. Of course, God does the substitutionary death with the ram, but at the same time, the writer of Hebrews says it's as if he died and rose again, and then Isaac disappears from the, the pages of Scripture at that point, and we don't see him again until the end of this chapter when the bride is coming for him, and he's coming for, uh, for the bride, a picture of the rapture of the church from 1 Thessalonians 4.16. 4, so very, uh, very interesting. The other thing that's here uh, theologically that we miss sometimes is the idea that, that it is the father, Abraham, who is sending this anonymous servant, a type of the Holy Spirit, to get the bride. It's the father's doing, and he gives the bride then to the son. Jesus Christ didn't need us. He is God. He is all sufficient. He doesn't need us. But God, the father, gives us to him as an expression of his own love to the son. Very, so there's very interesting. I think there's good reason why there's so much spent here in terms of verses, the number of verses uh, on this particular passage of scripture. It's the first place also we find the idea of, of marital love. We have that expression towards the end. It's the first time we have someone in, in scripture praying for divine guidance and, uh, that we'll see with the servant and very very interesting circumstances under which he does that. And the, I think, again, the point we want to see is that it's truly God, not just answering his prayer, but God orchestrating events so that this will happen. What was writing on it? Isaac had to have a bride so they could have a child, so he could have a bride, so he could have a child, and so on, so that uh, Judah could be born, so eventually David could be born, so eventually Jesus Christ could be born the Savior of the world. So there's only the redemption of mankind riding on the errand of the, of the servant. And uh, it's important. We'll see that in verses 1 to 9 because Abraham makes, makes him make a promise and swear an oath. Verse 1, now Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house who ruled over all that he had, Please put your uh, hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac. And the servant said to him, Perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me back to this land. Must I take your son to the land from which you came? But Abraham said to him, Beware that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, God, uh, the Lord, God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family, and who spoke to me and swore to me, saying to your descendants, I give this land. He will send his angel before you, 
and you shall take a wife for my son from there. And if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you'll be released from this oath. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. So the promise, first we say, involves a, a bride for Isaac. And um, I'm not really sure why, why the delay. I mean, Isaac's about 40 years old. I mean, he might have been just throwing a few hints like, uh, hey, Dad, it's, uh, I'm not getting any younger here. I don't know. Uh, it could have been the fact that uh, Sarah was maybe ill towards the end of her life. She finally dies, and she's buried. We saw that uh, last week as he purchased uh, her tomb at the, uh, uh, the cave of Mach Machpelah. And, she's, and maybe he's been in mourning because it's been a few more years. But for whatever reason, he realizes, I'm not getting any younger and neither is my son. And for the, the link of redemption to continue through him, according to the promise of God, he's got to have a wife. And so he sends this servant, but he makes him uh, make a promise in regards to it. Um, he makes it clear that his son was not to marry a Canaanite woman. And of course, uh, later in... Um, in the Torah, Moses would write, according to the law, no Jew could marry a, uh, a non-Jew, a person who doesn't know the Lord, doesn't walk with the Lord. It wasn't a racial thing. It was about a relationship with the Lord. And, uh, and we have the same, basically, uh, kind of situation in the New Testament where Paul tells us on a couple occasions that, that as believers, we should not marry unbelievers uh, as well. And you can imagine the the problems that would create uh, in your life and goals and ideas and the way you write, raise your children and handle your finances and, uh, and priorities and so forth, uh, very difficult. And uh, sometimes it happens. You just make the best you can. Sometimes you've got two people and one gets saved and the other one's not and can be tension and, and difficulty. But uh, here in this situation, we'll see that question asked right away when the servant finally gets there and he meets Rebecca, who is your mother? What's her name? Who is your family? Uh, does he really have the right person? Notice again the promise is sworn by an oath. Uh, the eldest servant here, I said, is anonymous. We met prior back in chapter 15, Eleazar, who is his servant from Damascus, who is basically the uh, the eldest guy at the time and in line to receive the inheritance if he doesn't have a son. But that's like 50 years ago. So we don't really know it's the same, the same guy. I've got my doubts it, uh, it is or, or because we've been introduced, uh, we would uh, have his name mentioned again. In terms of the, the oath, again, why is it such a big deal? Why the promise? Why sworn in this way? He makes him swear to three things, not to select a wife, from among the Canaanites uh, because, again, of the, there's a curse upon them that goes back to Noah. Remember, Noah comes off the ark. He blesses two of his sons. Then one of the grandsons, he places a curse on him. His name is Canaan, and the Canaanites are cursed after them, and it's being lived out among Abraham in terms of their depravity. So he says, do not let my son marry a Canaanite, whatever, whatever you do. I don't know how long this process is going to take, but if I die, you swear that you won't let this happen uh, because, again, God's promise is that through him, uh, my descendants will receive the land, all the earth will be blessed through one of his descendants and so forth. So it was a, it was a very, very big deal. Speaking of the depravity of man, <laughs> it's like I was just watching the news this morning. There's a gal who works for Macy's on the mainland, and uh, she uh, works in the ladies' de dress department, and a guy who's a cross-dresser comes in and wants to go into the women's fitting area to try on dresses. Because he's a guy, she won't let him. So Macy fires her for discrimination. <laughs> She's in court with a Christian attorney trying to get her job back. Right, but a few weeks ago, there was a, a case on the mainland where the parents of a little boy that was about eight years old was bringing law, a lawsuit against the Girl Scouts because their eight-year-old son, who was a cross-dresser and wore pink dresses to school, wanted to join the Girl Scouts. For some reason, they wouldn't let him, and so they were bringing a lawsuit against them. There's some strange things going on in this world. A few years ago, somebody would have been having a little counseling session with the parents, right? 
But now they've got an attorney going after the Girl, Scout, the Girl Scouts. Well, our depravity is nothing compared to what Abraham was seeing around him. But because of that depravity, he's very adamant about this idea. Do not select a wife for Isaac among the Canaanite women. He was to choose from Abraham's relatives, which uh, again ensues the trip back there to Ur, the Chaldeans. And um, what if she won't come? Should I take Isaac? Don't take him. Don't take him out of this land. Don't take him out of God's promised land. You keep him where God will watch over and protect him and where the promises are. He's, Abraham, he's learned his lessons. He's not like, let's go down to Egypt. He's not looking for a sunny trip in the southern Mediterranean anymore. He's just like, we're in the land. We're staying here. You're going to bury me here. This is what God said. He's very, very adamant. The other thing is that he gives them some words of encouragement. He tells them, in verse 7, that the Lord God of heaven who took me from my father's house from, from the land of my family and who spoke to me and swore to me, saying to your descendants, I give this land. Notice, he will send his angel before you and you shall take a wife for my son from there. According to Abraham, it's like, this is going to happen. <laughs> you know, the, you know the, the, the servant's going, yeah, but what if she won't come back? Well, you're released from the oath. But I'm just telling you, it's going to happen. God's going to go before you. This, you know, Abraham is like in a whole different place than he was back in chapter 12 or when he's lying about Sarah, his wife, in Egypt or with the Philistines and so forth. This is a guy that's, that's uh, in the zone. And he's just walking with God, believing his promises and so forth. He says this is going to, to happen. So again, beautiful typology of the father willing to give the son, the son willing to sacrifice his life in a sense, raised from the dead. We don't see him again. Now the father is sending this servant who's like the Holy Spirit, drawing a bride for him. And one more theological note about this is that when we get to the point in a moment where the servant gets there and prays for guidance, he never asks for a miracle. I mean, he asks for guidance, but he's asking for some everyday circumstances. Okay, Lord, I just pray if a girl comes down here and you know, she's going to get water, and she offers me water, and, you know, it's just normal, everyday kinds of occurrence. He's not asking for uh, any molecular structure of anything to be changed, as opposed to Gideon in Judges, who's trying to discern God's will, and he's saying, yeah, Lord, I'm not really sure about this, because I don't really trust you, I don't really believe you. Uh, that's why we say putting out fleeces isn't really a, a statement of faith, it's a statement of your lack of faith, you know, but again, he puts out the sheepskin and if it, in the morning it come out and it's full of water and the ground is dry then i'll know that it's you of course the lord does that that was a miracle and he says oh we'll reverse that process if i come out in the morning and the the ground is wet and the fleece is dry then i'll really know that it's you and he's so we talk about this putting out a fleece that's not a good way to discern god's will it's kind of testing god uh in here uh, no miracle is going to be asked normal events of life very different from that situation but nonetheless we need to learn to trust the Lord that he'll lead and guide us. J.I. Packer says that believers are never in the grip of blind forces, fortune, chance, luck, or fate. All that happens to them is divinely planned, and each event comes as a new summons to trust, obey, and rejoice. Because after all, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. And I have to tell you, I was struggling with that verse a little bit last night, about 6 o'clock, when I walked out to my, my beautiful 98 Toyota Corolla. I can understand why someone would want to steal this car. <laughs> In, the envy of many, I'm sure. But nonetheless, someone did. So they had, <laughs> I go to get in, and somebody had put a screwdriver into the lock on the passenger side which was the only one that worked because a couple of years ago, somebody tried on the other side. I don't want to put 50 bucks into the car, so I just opened it from the other side and walked back around, being a very practical person that I am. <laughs> so here I am now. It's like, oh, yeah, I can't get in the other way. Get in. Uh, getting kind of dark. Um, how will I get in my car? Ah, the trunk. <laughs> By God's sovereignty, I just moved some shelves in it so the back seats were facing forward. They were open so I could open the trunk and maybe I could reach through with a little metal rod and get that uh, little lock. To... No, it didn't work. 
So now I've got to crawl in through this opening. You know, it's, it's really big in that Corolla. It's about that big. And I have this vision of me getting halfway and being stuck, my heels hanging out the trunk, and half of me the other way, praying that a security guard will come by before it gets to be like 9 or 10 o'clock at night. You know? So anyway, I made it through, popped the locks, got out. Glad there wasn't a lot of people around to witness what I was doing. And... Uh, and was able to uh, to drive home, uh, which time the Lord and I, of course, were having a conversation about Romans 8.28. I just wasn't really seeing how it was all working for good yet. I'm still working on it. I'm still working on it, trusting that it will. The good thing, I guess, is I'm going to get both of my locks fixed because I would have never, never done it otherwise. But we go through these times in life, and God is watching, and God is orchestrating events. This servant must fulfill a promise and we're going to see him pray for success. And uh, it's a very interesting little way that he goes about discerning God's will. Verse 10, then the servant took 10 of his master's camels and departed for his master's, for, for all of his master's goods were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, the city of Nahor. And he made his camels kneel down outside the city by a well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. Then he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, here I stand by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, drink, and I will also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this, I will know that you've shown kindness to my master. And it happened before he finished speaking. The behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, uh, Abraham's brother, came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. Now the young, young woman was very beautiful to behold, a virgin no man had known her. And she went down to the well, filled her pitcher, and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Please let me drink a little water from your pitcher. So she said, Drink, my lord. Then she quickly let her pitcher down to her hand and gave him a drink. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they finish drinking. Then she quickly emptied her pitcher into the trough, ran back to the well to draw water, and drew for all of his camels. And the man wondering at her, remained silent, so as to know whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. <laughs> the servant prays, and he develops a plan. And uh, verse 10, I mean, encompasses the idea. That he just tracked 900 miles. I mean, as the crow flies, maybe it's five, but, you know, he's going to follow water. So he's going to go up north and then drop back down following the Euphrates, which was the, uh, the typical way. Uh, it would have taken him a couple of months. And remember that Ur the Chaldeans, when we were back there being introduced to Abraham in chapter 12, we talked a bit about it. I think I even showed you one of the ziggurats and uh, a city that's uh, very excavated to this day. It was a large, very sophisticated city. It's not like this, this little village and there's like, like 30 people living there and maybe he'll get one of the five gals that's going to come out. There's probably a lot of wells, but he stops at this one. There's thousands of people that live in this city, and there's probably thousands of these women that are going out to get water in the evening. He's at this well, and he prays this, this prayer. Very good to kind of keep that in mind. And basically, he's praying, and his prayer, he's acting in faith that the Lord is going to somehow lead him to the right per, uh, person. He's praying, and he's got this plan, of course. He's going to if uh, this gals comes out, he'll see one, he'll go up, can I have a drink? If she gives him a drink, that's great. And if she says, and I'll give you water for all of your camels, then, uh, then he'll know that she's the one. Again, he's not asking for a miraculous sign, seeking guidance in a sense through ordinary events, not a fleece, uh, we would say. And, uh, and we would say the prayer seems to be answered. Rebecca comes out, she's beautiful, she's a virgin, he asks for the water, uh, and so forth. Look at verse 15, though, very important to note that she's well on her way before he ever prays this. God is orchestrating the events, and it happened before he finished speaking his prayer. 
in his heart, we'll find out, that behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with a pitcher on her shoulder. So she left a long time ago. Uh, she's on her way there. He's praying, Lord, I pray that someone will come. Well, she's already coming. So, I mean, God is orchestrating these, uh, these events uh, through his providence so that these two people will, will come together. And I just want to say it is the first time somebody prays for divine guidance. God seems to answer their prayer. I don't think this is a real good way to seek God's, uh, God's wisdom. This would be like a, a, a young gal who, at whatever age she is, feels like she ought to be married by now. She's sitting in Pizza Hut on a Friday night, and she's saying something like, and Lord, I just pray, you know, I just need to know the right one. So, you know, anyone that comes in, if there's a guy that comes in, and he's pretty good looking, and he lar orders a large pepperoni pizza, I'll know he's the one. We're all laughing because people do this kind of stuff. <laughs> and we're, we're always giving God these directional from now, Lord, if you do this and you do this, then I'll know that this, you know, and we're like, you know, because God, you know, he needs a lot of help, right? Because he can't, he could have never pulled this off, you know, without this servant praying this. Pr no, Rebecca's already on her way uh, to, to meet the guy. But um, just to give you, as we'll get to in a moment, this is no, no easy deal when she says, I'll water the camels. Oh, by the way. Now, if the gal in the pizza had it prayed, and Lord, I pray that uh, this guy comes in, he, he orders a large pepperoni pizza with olives, and then he comes over and offers me some, and then stands and offers to wash everyone's car and wax everyone's car in the place, I'll know he's the one. See, that's, that's a little closer to what this guy is saying, saying here. Uh, but sometimes, again, we don't want to make it too tough for God <laughs> because our prayers may not be answered. But notice he's evaluating Rebecca as she does this. He sees that she's kind, she's pleasant, she's humble, <laughs> she's healthy and a, and a hard worker. Uh, you remember the deal about the camels, though? You know, we always think that camels are very typical. Remember they weren't typical? The only reason Abraham has got these is because he got them from Pharaoh. And at this point in time, not too many people had Pharaohs. They were like a... They were the Maserati, the Lamborghinis of their day. I mean, this is, if you had a camel, man, you, you got the mode of transportation. He's got 10. He's probably got more than 10. I mean, he's got the 10 camels. That's the idea of watering, but he probably has a dowry, we'll find out. A lot of gold and things with him. Probably has lots of men with weapons with him as well. Hey, 1,000 miles across the desert, you're driving 10 Lamborghinis. They're loaded with sacks of gold. I think you better have a, a few guys with weapons with you. So he's got a whole entourage here. I mean, just to kind of get the, the full picture. Let me just read from um, uh, one authority. He says, to grasp what a wonder this is, we must understand that the ancient well was large, a deep hole in the earth with steps leading down to a spring of water. So each drawing of water required substantial effort. And more, a camel typically would drink about 25 gallons of water, and an ancient water jar would hold about three gallons of water. This means that Rebecca would have made between 80 and 100 descents into the well and back up again. I'm betting she didn't go to the gym later. What do you, th what do you think? <laughs> I mean, this guy is estimating a good hour and a half hard work. So down the steps, a flight of steps, three gallons of water, not in a little plastic jar, but a uh, a ceramic jug that's got a few pounds to it anyway. This gal's in good shape, man. She's back up the steps. And she does it a hundred times. It's like, so when she, when she says, I'll water the camels, this guy's going, pretty sure she's the one. Because <laughs> what he asked was so, was so outrageous. So he's, he's a guy that made a promise. He's definitely on a mission that he's got to fulfill. He prays for success. And uh, verse 22 to 31, he's pretty positive that the Lord has directed him. Look what happens next. So it was, when the camels had finished drinking, that the man took a golden nose ring, weighing half a shekel, and two bracelets for her wrist, weighing ten shekels of gold, and said, Whose daughter are you? Tell me, please. Is there room in your father's house for us to lodge? So she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, Milcah's son, whom she bore to Nahor. Moreover, she said to him, we have both straw and feed enough and room to lodge. I think his pulse just went up a little bit. Then the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. And he said, blessed be the Lord God of my master, Abraham. And that's when her pulse went up because she knows who Abraham is. 
That's her grandfather's brother. They know about him. She's probably getting a little excited at this point as well. Who has not forsaken his mercy and his truth towards my master? As for me, being on the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. So what does she do? <laughs> so the young women ran and told her mother's household these things. Now, Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban. Laban uh, ran out to meet the well, uh, man by the well. So it came to pass when he saw the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrist, and when he heard the words of his sister Rebecca saying, Thus the man spoke to me, that he went to meet the man, and there he stood by the camels at the well, by the Maseratis. And he said, Come in, <laughs> O blessed of the Lord. Why should you stand outside? For I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. Now, of course, if you've you know, been a study of Genesis, you kind of know who Laban is already, right? He's like, uh, he's like the, uh, I'd say he's the Murdy Murdoch of the Mediterranean. Of course, you have to know who Rapper Wivinger is, to know who Murdy Murdoch is. But this is like a used car sales guy. I mean, he's probably uh, selling trinkets on the way to meet the guy. Uh, he sees the gold. He sees the nose ring. He sees the 10 Maseratis in the driveway. He's like, come right on in here. You know, this is the guy that is always looking for somebody to use and to take advantage of. And we'll, we'll have more about him when, when Jacob uh, encounters him here in a few chapters. But again, the positive confirmation comes when, uh, when he hears the name of her grandfather and had to get very excited about that uh, at that point. Uh, she is the granddaughter of Nahor, uh, the brother of Abraham. He's got the right gal. He's got the right family. And then the positive confirmation, what does it do? This guy gets down and worships the Lord. Verse 26, he bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his mercy and his truth towards my master. You kind of get why, why he's the head guy and why Abraham uh, sends him. He's a spiritual guy. I mean, he's praying. He's trying to make a plan. Man, when God comes through, he does, he's not thinking, you know, when I get to church, you know, later in the week, I'm going to really give thanks for this. He's just like, man, hallelujah. I've got, well, he's, come on, he's two months on the road. You know, he shows up in this well. She comes out. He does this thing. She goes, I'll water all the camels. I don't care if it takes two hours. And then it turns out that uh, this is his close relative. I think we'd all be saying hallelujah at that point. But... Uh, uh, the line, very important, whose daughter are you? Very key question. Interested in the family, but uh, certainly wider application for us as well. Whose child are you? That's a good question to ask. You're interested in someone and you're single. Whose child are they? Is God their father? Or is Satan their father? You know, Paul says, uh, <coughs> uh, says uh, in uh, Acts 26, and I'm sending you to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. People that are not, that have not come to God are under the power of Satan. It's pretty good to find out who your, your father-in-law is going to be before you start the whole, the whole deal out. It's a pretty good question to ask, and it should be the first question that's asked. The positive confirmation brings, again, the formal invitation from Laban. Again, we learn more about him and his character in chapter 24. And uh, I'm sure what we know about him, he's very excited about the number of camels, and he's very excited about the gold and silver that they might contain. And he is really excited about the fact that uh, there's already been some gifts uh, given. So he runs to the well to, uh, to meet this anonymous servant. So there's a promise he must fulfill. He prays for success. He's got some positive feedback. The Lord's with him. But now he's got to make a proposal. And uh, we say with great urgency. Notice how he does it in verse 32. Then the man came to the house. He unloaded the camels and provided straw and feed for the camels and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. Food was set before him to eat. But he said, I will not eat until I have told you about my errand. And he said, speak on. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master greatly, and he has become great. And he has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male and female servants, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she is old. And to him, he has given all that he has. Now my master made me swear, saying, you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites. 
in whose land I dwell. But you shall go to my father's house and to my family and take a wife for my son. And I said to my master, perhaps the woman will not follow me. But he said, the Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with you and prosper your way. And you shall take a wife for my son, from my family, and from my father's house. You will be clear from this oath when you arrive among my family. For if they will not give her to you, then you will be released from my oath. And this day I came to the well and said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, if you will now prosper the way in which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass that when the virgin comes out to draw water, I shall say to her, Please give me a little water from your pitcher to drink. And she says to me, Drink, and I will draw water for your camels. Also, let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. You think this is interesting to Rebecca? She's kind of catching the, the whole prayer thing and everything at this point. Verse 45, But before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebecca coming out with her pitcher on her shoulder. And she went down to the well and drew water. And I said to her, Please let me drink. And she made haste and let her pitcher down from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give your camels a drink also. So I drank, and she gave the camels a drink also. Then I asked her and said, Whose daughter are you? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Naor's son, and Milka, uh, whom Milcah bore to him. And I will, uh, so I put the nose ring on her nose, little detail that wasn't there before, and the bracelets on her wrist. And I bowed down my head and worshiped the Lord. Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who led me in the way of truth to take the daughter of my master's brother for his son. Now, if you will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. It's the marriage proposal. And no, he does two things here. He tells them, well, let's just say this. This is very, this is very typical uh, Middle Eastern and therefore very typical Jewish and what we get from the scriptures. This idea of, okay, you just told us all of this. Do we really have to repeat this again? Absolutely. Absolutely. You see it all the time in scripture. Why? It changes a little. There's details here that wasn't there before. We've got a different audience. He's got to make his case. And he builds his case on two things. Let me tell you, this is who I am, and I'm Abraham's servant. I'm at the right place. Let me tell you how great my master is. Let me tell you how great he is. And then let me tell you how God orchestrated all of these events. That's what he's going to make his case. Will you give me this daughter, put her on a camel, let me march her 900 miles across the, uh, the countryside, and you'll never see her again. Will you trust me with your daughter to do that? It's kind of a big Big deal, right? She's not going to be sending postcards home. They're not going to call on the cell phone, and there is no Skype. I mean, this is it. They'll never see her again. Is this really a guy that we should entrust? And he builds this whole argument around the fact that, hey, God is in this thing from the beginning. So the proposal includes, therefore, retelling the story. Uh, again, when he retells the story, he includes the idea that God would send the angel to make a point that, you know, that God is going before, God is orchestrating these events. He also added that the angel would make his journey a success in getting a wife for Isaac from his own family. We also know that he deletes the refusal of Abraham to let Isaac come there. I mean, that wouldn't go over too good, you know. It's like, oh, yeah, and Abraham, whatever you do, don't let Isaac come to this crummy little country here in your little family. He kind of that's a good smart move. He kind of omits that part, right? So he's emphasizing details to make his case that they might uh, accept the proposal. <laughs> you gals are going, was it quite that way when my husband proposed to me? He didn't go on and on about how great his father was and how God was in this, but that's what's going on here. The, uh, secondly, the proposal includes a description, as I said, the greatness of God. God has blessed Abraham, flocks, herds, servants, donkeys, silver, gold, which must have really impressed uh, Laban, of course. But again, recounting his pledge uh, to find a wife and the concerns and then giving the details of the prayer and how God answered the prayer, as he said, leading him in the way of truth. Well, the parents and the brother, Laban, give their answer. Verse 50. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing comes from the Lord. We cannot speak to you either bad or good. Here's Rebekah before you. Take her and go. 
and let her be your master's son's wife, as the Lord has spoken. And it came to pass when Abram's servant heard the words that he worshiped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. Then the servant brought out jewelry of silver, jewelry of gold, and clothing, and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. And he and the men who were with him ate and drank and stayed all night. Then they arose in the morning and said, Send me away to my master. But her brother and her mother said, Let the young woman stay with us a few days, at least ten. After that she may go. And he said to them, Do not hinder me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away, so that I may go to my master. So they said, We will call the young woman and ask her personally. Then they called Rebecca, said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. So they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands, of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate you. <coughs> so they bless her as she goes. Uh, but again, they agree, the parents agree to the marriage. And, uh, and notice he's, uh, you know, they agree initially, yeah, she can go with you. The next morning, okay, we're ready to go. Well, we didn't think it'd be that fast. And uh, very interesting. There's certainly an urgency to what's going on here with the servant. I mean, he just trekked for a couple of months to get there. It's like one night, you know, and you're, you're, you're ready to, to go already. Uh, but he's not really thinking of himself. He just got a mission. He's going to do it. And this is what he needs to do. Uh, interesting also, I don't know if he's, uh, I would suspect somebody that's in charge of everything in Abraham's household. He's probably a guy that can read people pretty well. He's probably already got Laban figured out. And if he figures, I'm here 10 more days, that guy's going to figure out a way to get more of my money than he ought to have and probably half of my camels. I'm lucky to just to get out of here in the morning. I don't know if that's what's going on, but uh, knowing Laban, he would have probably figured out a way to get at least one of those camels out of him. But, uh, and so he says, hey, we're out of here in the morning. Uh, they agree. He busts out the, uh, the dowry, which uh, would have been provided for them. Uh, and then they have to agree and ask her. Uh, and again, that's where the, uh, the typology continues. The Holy Spirit, the servant, is going to gather a bride for Christ. And he is orchestrating events sovereignly so that things come together. But still, Rebecca had to say, I will go. There's still a free will that's exercised. It's, uh, it's, even that is down into the, uh, the detail. And I think that would have been fairly uncommon. It pretty much parents arrange, they decide. There's no, oh, what do you think personally about this? I mean, even today in India and a lot of places in the Middle East, you have arranged, arranged marriages, you know. And sometimes they get a say in it, but a lot of times they don't. It's just all uh, arranged for them. But uh, the parents and brother bless Rebecca as she leaves. She uh, makes the statement, I will go. She exercises her free will choice in this. Jesus says this in one statement, kind of bringing both of these ideas together of God's sovereignty and free will. He says in John, all that the Father gives me will come to me. So everybody, the, the, the events of God the Father orchestrating by means of the Holy Spirit Everything that God is going to do, all those that he's going to bring are going to come. Did you come to faith in Jesus Christ because of your choice? No, you, because the Holy Spirit drew you. <laughs> but did you have a choice? Well, Jesus said, and the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Kind of brings both ideas together. And we've seen a lot of other passages as well. God honoring free choice. Jesus over, uh, over Jerusalem weeps over the city and says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stoned the prophets and killed those sent to you, how I long to gather you as a hen gathers her chickens together. But, this is what I wanted to do, but you were not willing. And he honors their free will choice as he does ours as well. Uh, notice then the purposes of God are fulfilled. This is where the camera begins to go in slow motion as the bride and the groom are starting to come together. Verse 61, Then Rebekah and her maids arose, and they rose in the camels and followed the man. So the servant took Rebekah and departed. Now Isaac came from the way of Be'er Lahai Roy, for he dwelt in the south. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening. Just so happened. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and there the camels were coming. Are there a lot of camels around? No, he knows who it is. Verse 64, then Rebekah lifted her eyes 
and the camera zeroes in so you can see her lifting her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from her camel, for she had said to the servant, who is this man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, it is my master. So she took a veil and covered herself. See, they're in slow motion at that point. They're coming together. She's putting the veil on. And the servant told Isaac all the things he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Well, again, the purposes of God are seen in this beautiful meeting. Uh, I, I, as I said, it's about uh, a two-month journey uh, to get back to, uh, from uh, Mesopotamia to uh, this area uh, in southern Israel. And uh, we can bet that uh, Abraham and Isaac both were doing a little bit of prayer, maybe Isaac doing a little bit more about this mission of the, uh, of the servant going to get a wife, going out in the evening to, uh, to meditate on the things of God. And man, here, here they come, his gold-adorned bride uh, on, on the camel. And, uh, and again, just that beautiful picture uh, of the church coming to uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, he's living in the south down there, established on, uh, on his own. Uh, very interesting. Remember, we were introduced to Be'er Lahai Roy when uh, Hagar runs away uh, the first time from uh, Abraham and Sarah back in chapter 16. Uh, God intervenes and she calls the place the well of him who lives and sees. Again, speaking of just the, God's providence and his sovereignty in this whole story. He's out there meditating she comes. Now, again, her etiquette called for her. A stranger is coming. She has to get off of the camel. And uh, Jewish commentaries say that the veil that she placed on was a wedding veil. So she's not only showing submission to him by getting off of the camel, she's also saying, I'm the one. <laughs> she puts on the wedding veil so he knows exactly uh, who, who that is. And their eyes meet for the first time. But uh, And then... Uh, purposes of God culminated in the marriage. And so, you know, Isaac, he's like 40 years old. He says, we're doing this right now. I've, I've been waiting for a, a decade for this or whatever, this moment, however, however long it is. And, uh, and so they go right interesting again. So Sarah has gone to be with the Lord for a couple of three years. Her tent is there. It's maintained. It's waiting for this moment. And so they, they enter Sarah's tent they're married because Rebecca now becomes the matriarch of what will be the nation of Israel and, uh, and uh, the sons that will be born to them. And again, very interesting. Uh, and they come together and they're married and he loved her. We got to do it different. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of the biblical way. You, God orchestrates and you come together and you love each other and then you date for the rest of your life. See, we reverse it. We date... Until we think we love each other, we get married, and that's kind of flat lines after that. But, you know, it's supposed, to, it's, supposed to go, it's supposed to go the other way. You know, it's supposed to, now we really learn what, uh, what real, real love is. I can't remember, I always had a, uh, there's a great Dietrich Bonhoeffer quote about marriage. <clears throat> and I can't remember the whole thing, but just to, uh, to paraphrase, he says that, you know, when you love each other individually before you're married, you know, you, you think that's everything, that that's, that's the world. Like, that's really making your relationship because, you know, you love each other. But when you commit yourself publicly before God and others, now your relationship is public and it changes everything. And he says, says from now on, it is not your love that is making the marriage. It is your marriage that will make the love because everything changes after that because you become a picture of Jesus Christ and the church, which we see often uh, in the New Testament, which you can understand because of that picture and the meaning and the purpose of a man and a woman coming together and having a family. That becomes such a great testimony of God and his relationship with us. You understand why... Your marriage is under attack all the time from the enemy. He uses the culture, he uses the media, he uses a lot of things, but you can understand why you're under attack. And so, so important that we're praying for our marriages. But here, this culminates in marriage. She becomes the matriarch of, uh, of the nation of, of Israel, but a great, uh, a great story of God orchestrating events. <laughs> Would this happen without the... the, the the prayer for the camels and the whole deal. I think God brings them together anyway. I don't think this is a great lesson on how to know God's will by 
by fostering up to God these outrageous demands that he has to do so that you can really know that you can trust him. I think it's better to say, help me to just trust you. That's what the writer of Proverbs says, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart, only if God does certain things. No, it just says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. It's, uh, the scriptures do not say that God helps those who helps themselves. That's the Quran that says that. The Bible says God helps those who entrust themselves to him completely, as did Abraham, Isaac, Rebekah, and the servant. Ken Hughes says the God of Scripture is not simply a God of miracles who occasionally injects his power into life. He is far greater because he arranges all of life to suit and affect his providence. This makes all of life a miracle. God is over all. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, all-controlling. This is the God of Scripture. Anything less is an idolatrous reduction of our puny imaginations. Can God orchestrate events in our lives? Can he control what's going on? I, I, think, that he, that he, I think that he can. Do, do we need to make crazy, crazy prayers to try to find out what his will is? No, we just need to entrust ourselves uh, uh, to him, and he will guide and, and direct our paths. Well, let's pray.